live from Earth, it's Space Radio. This is Paul Sutter, and coming up, we're talking about the best space of the decade, and of course, taking listener questions about all things in the universe, because that's what this show is about. We record every Thursday at 8 p.m. Eastern, and you can follow along or leave a voicemail at spaceradioshow.com. And today's Blue Shift, I'll be talking about what can we expect with some 2020 vision. But first, the news. Hello, space cadets. Welcome to Space Radio. I'm Paul Sutter, astrophysicist at Stony Brook University and the Flatiron Institute. And for the next half hour, your agent to the stars. We've got an exciting show for you today where we talk about all things space, astronomy, astrophysics, rocketry. If it's above the Earth's atmosphere, it's in this show's universe. This show lives on listener questions. We record every Thursday at 8 p.m. Eastern here in Spaceman Studios in New York City. So leave a voicemail at space radioshow.com to get yourself on the air you can also follow along with our space cadets tuning in live from around the world including but not limited to howell new jersey washington dc pell city alabama and chicago and more check out space radioshow.com for the links to the youtube and twitch live streams i will take questions that you send there too seriously folks i've prepped Basically no material at all, and that's how this show works. You're in charge, except you're not. But get those questions in. Oh, Astro B just missed you, and Spade Ninja 9, Courtney BC in London, UK. How's it going, Space Cadets? You feeling the holiday spirit? That's too bad. It's all right. You'll get there. You'll get there. Don't worry. The holidays are upon us. The new year. A new Smyrna Beach. I used to live in Daytona Beach. I had a good friend who lived in New Smyrna. Way better than old Smyrna Beach. Man, those guys are just lame. Very glad they made a new Smyrna Beach. Merry Christmas to those who celebrate it. Happy holidays to the people who want to be happy. I don't know. Happy December. Happy Jane. Oh, man, so many more. Austin, Earth, Maggie Valley. Is the cheese any better in New York City? Ooh, I got something. I got something for you. Don't worry. I'm not going to show you. Don't worry. Don't worry. Are you guys excited for the new decade? No? Okay, fine. You know what? I am. I guess it's all me carrying all the cheer and excitement. Now is it FIFO fast way to go with the hype train. I love it. Thank you so much for that. Let's talk about the 2010s. Before I start taking questions, I wanted to share some interesting bits of news I caught recently. And this is the last episode of space radio this decade. Now I know the pedants of, Amongst you will say, uh, the decade doesn't really start until 2021, but I am talking about the fact that a, a decade has passed. The 2010s are over. We're not putting a one in that tens place in the digits for our years anymore, so that decade is finished. And there, there was some major stuff. It was a very momentous decade. For example, this decade saw the launch of space radio, and that's worth celebrating and remembering, at least among this circle. I would think so, and, you know, that maybe it's just me. Okay, other important things happened, like detecting gravitational waves for the first time. This is back in 2017. Over 100 years ago, Einstein predicted the existence of gravitational waves. And he even he was like, yeah, but we're never going to see him. I mean, come on, guys. But I'm Einstein. I got to write this down. I got to write another paper about this. 100 years later, we proved Einstein wrong by proving him right. We did do it. Take that, Albert. But we found exactly what he predicted we would find. And we saw two black holes merging through their gravitational waves. That's just awesome. We saw thousands of new exoplanets through the Kepler Space Telescope mission. 
worlds orbiting other stars of all sorts of shapes and colors and sizes. Okay, the shapes are mostly round, but you get the idea. Thousands of them. We think there's somewhere around a trillion planets in the galaxy. And we just barely scratched the surface, but this was, this was the hot decade. This was the hot decade for exoplanets. And there was Planck, the Planck mission, opening up the cosmic microwave background, revealing it in detail that no one has ever measured before. There's a special place in my heart for the Planck mission and its observations of the earliest, oldest light in the universe because I was a member of the Planck team and I did, I was a cog in that machine doing some of the data analysis, making those maps, getting that juicy cosmological data out. That was fun. That, that was all, that will always hold a special place in my heart. We've got the New Horizons mission blasting by Pluto. It spent like, what, 20 minutes near Pluto? It took nine years to get there, and it didn't even take its coat off before leaving again. How rude, but we'll give it to it. That plucky little spacecraft is still traveling beyond the bounds of our solar system, uncovering new worlds. It sounds like an intro to Star Trek, but no, this is New Horizons. And also the Voyager probes made it past the boundaries of an into interstellar space. Congratulations, humanity. We are officially an interstellar species. We did it. We did it. We The sun could blow up tomorrow and we will have a legacy in the form of two hunks of metal hurtling through the endless void between the stars. You know what? As legacies go, that's not so bad. We've got finding building blocks of life on other worlds with the Rosetta mission, looking at comets, looking at asteroids. We, we've got... We've done so much around our solar system, confirming that there is liquid water in the icy moons of the outer world. And no, Nancy Graziano on the Space Cadet YouTube channel, I will not forget about asteroid Bennu and our exploration of it with the OSIRIS-REx mission. Currently doing whatever it's doing over there, checking out that big chunk of rock. Man, there's more news to share. There's more. It's just, oh. I got to get to space flight. Okay, I'll do space flight after the break. I promise. Uh, so we're not going to have a conversation right now. Sorry. No, no. This is this is the year-end episode, folks. There are no rules. There is no pattern. What do you think is going to happen? This is the end of the decade. We got to let it loose. We got to let it fly. And speaking of letting it fly... How about SpaceX and Blue Origins and reusable rockets making it cheaper to go into space? That was a 2010s thing. That will go down in the 3,000 years from now in the Wikipedia summary of 2010s. There'll be one little bullet point. Oh, yeah, and we figured out this whole reusable autopilot landing rocket thing. Hopefully it leads to something good. We'll find out in the 2020s, I suppose. In the interstellar visitors, oh my gosh, the space cadets are blowing up here, giving me ideas of, of what happened in the past decade. Yes, the interstellar visitors. We've got Oumuamua, which I love saying. It's a Hawaiian word roughly translating to scout, which was the first confirmed interstellar object entering through our solar system. By the time we spotted it, it had already blown by in its loop around the sun. It is still in our solar system, but it's way out there past Jupiter already. So, And it's really tiny, so it's hard to see. So that's all we got. But then it had another friend come by this year. Uh, the name is escaping me, and I'm sure the space cadets will help me out with the name of the second interstellar visitor this year uh, that came by this year. So we got two in one decade confirmed interstellar objects. Man, yeah, Nancy Graziano, this is so much fun. The space cadets are, are giving me so much cool ideas because uh, going back to the reusable rockets with SpaceX, not only do we have the launches, but like with the with the attached booster thing and then the boosters detach and then they land themselves and it's like, wow, this is the future, except it's the present and, and now it's the past, which I understand is a little bit confusing, but that is the nature of time. We've got a transit of Venus in 2012, which if you're interested in transits of Venus, that was a momentous event. 
Borisov. Thank you, Nebula, over on YouTube. Borisov is the interstellar comet that we spotted this year. Wow. Whew. I'm out of breath. Greg, do you see me? Do you see me? I am. I'm exhausted. I, I had so much excitement over the 2010s. It was a good decade for space. I feel good about the 2010s and what we've learned and what we've accomplished and what we've built. Pat yourself on the back, humanity, because the 2010s is, that's going to go down in the history book. But you know what? This, this isn't all my show. It is all my show, but people send me questions. And just because it's the end of the decade doesn't mean that we can't that we can ignore questions, right? So let's go. We've got a voicemail ready to go. Hey, Greg, would you play that tape for the last time this year? Hello. Can gravitons be um, the size of a Planck unit? And if gravitons are floating by themselves in the universe, could that be the source of uh, dark matter? All right, thanks. Ooh, really fun question asking about gravitons and dark matter and just what are they? So if you've never heard the word graviton before, it's time for a little lesson. Every one of the forces of nature has, you can view it this way, a particle that carries it around. So there's a bunch of light hitting your eyeballs that let you see right now. That light is carried by a particle called the photon. Another force of nature, the strong nuclear force, is carried by a set of eight particles known as the gluons because guess what they do? They glue particles together. And then the weak nuclear force gets three carriers called the... W and Z bosons. W is for weak. Z is for Z for out of ideas. And, but that's what it is. The fourth force of nature is gravity. In a fully developed magical quantum world view where gravity has a quantum mechanical description, the gravity the force of gravity will be carried by some, a particle called the graviton. We do not have a quantum description of gravity. It's something we've been working on for, I don't know, 70 years now. And various fits and starts, and we've had some ideas in a bunch of blind alleys, and that's a whole different discussion. Right now, in our understanding of gravity, gravity is not carried by a particle like the other forces are. Instead, gravity is due to the bending of space and time itself. This is Einstein's general relativity, the same thing that gave us, you know, the gravitational waves. But we want to have a quantum description of gravity because all the other three forces of nature have a quantum description. So why isn't gravity playing along? Well, it's complicated. We believe that if it did have a quantum description, there would be this particle called the graviton, but we don't have that quantum description. So maybe there isn't a graviton, but maybe there is, and it's just really messy. But I'll get to the second part of that question after the break. I'm Paul Sutter, and this is Space Radio. This show is brought to you by you. Go to patreon.com slash PM Sutter. It was true in the 2010s, and it'll be true in the 2020s. Figure out how you can support the show by going to that website, patreon.com slash PM Sutter. Oh, I'm totally saying that, Astro B. Space Force, uh, Starfleet. No first stars yet. That's good. I'm not sure about the Space Force. Okay. The best is yet to come. I believe that too. Hey, it's all right, Nebula, to have a deep love for electrons. They may be, you know, repulsive, but someone's got to love them. And Astro B photons are massless. Yeah, Larry, the universe is still made. We have no idea what most of the stuff in the universe is made of, that's for sure. All right, plenty of space cadet questions and comments. All right. 
All right, good questions. And uh, okay, keep those questions coming. We got we got a nice we got a big segment. We're gonna wrap it up here on a strong note, right, guys? All in. Welcome back, everyone. I'm Paul Sutter, and this is Space Radio. We've got more questions ready to go, but remember, you can join the conversation by leaving an online voicemail or by following the live stream. Check out spaceradioshow.com for all the links. Now, that question that we were talking about before the break was asking about gravitons, and gravitons are a hypothetical particle that carries the gravitational force in a quantum description of gravity of gravity if we had a quantum description of gravity so in that make-believe world where we can fully describe gravity through quantum mechanics there would be this particle called the graviton and the question also was asking about uh, is this the dark matter if it's floating around what's its size if the graviton exists it would be massless it would have no mass at all this is what enables it to travel across the galaxy you can, or across the universe. You can feel gravity from infinite range. If there's an object on the other side of the universe, technically it does exert a small, tiny, barely there, but not zero gravitational force on you. And so in order to do that, the graviton has to be massless. And could it be the dark matter? Graviton, by definition, is the thing that carries gravity from place to place. Objects that have mass will generate and respond to gravitons, like they will glow in gravitons in this picture. And that glowing is how we sense their weight and their mass and their attraction. And then we absorb the gravitons and that makes us pulled to that object. So the dark matter has to be something that creates gravitons. It's something that creates gravity rather than being gravity itself. Now, not to... I don't want to ignore the space cadets. The space cadets loyal throughout the decade. Well, at least for as long as this show has existed. And they've got questions galore. Abdullah Hassan on YouTube is asking, what books would you recommend to start learning astrophysics, cosmology, and astronomy? Excellent question. I wish I had planned that. I have two suggestions for you. Are you ready? And yes, yes, folks, I'm doing it. Suggestion number one. Paul Sutter's Your Place in the Universe, Understanding Our Big Messy Existence. That's right. It's the book that I wrote. I am pitching it myself to answer your question. But that's exactly what this book is for. You're curious about the universe and how we came to know about the universe and what the universe is all about? That's the book. That's why I wrote it, so that you could learn it. Now, the second book is... Paul Sutter's How to Die in Space, A Journey Through Dangerous Astrophysical Phenomenon. That is my next book coming out. It's coming out this June, published by Pegasus. And man, I just, I swear, today, this morning, I got the pre-proof edits done in PDF so I can see how the pages will look, how the chapters are laid out. It's a its a gorgeous loving looking book. I love the font they chose. I'm very, very much in love with the font and the layout and just everything, the book, the content that's up for you, that's to you for you to decide. But the book itself looks great. I love the cover too, because it has an astronaut's helmet and the sun is exploding in the, in the reflection of the visor. It's hilarious. It is available for pre-order on Amazon. You gotta wait a bit because it won't come out until June. But it's talking. It's a book about astrophysics. It's a book about supernova and dark matter and asteroids and the vacuum of space time itself. It's a book about just awesome astrophysics. So your place in the universe, if you want to learn about the universe and how to die in space, if you want to not die in space. If you've got an intrepid interplanetary explorer in your family, this is the gift for them. And that's right. I just spent five minutes plugging my own book. And am I ashamed? No, I am not. 
Larry Beckham over on YouTube is asking, did I see the paper about a, a star that disappeared? Uh, apparently there's the suggestions like we were observing a star and it just blinked out of existence and it didn't explode. And so that's weird. People are wondering, did, did some alien civilization like build a giant shell around it and obscure it? I haven't read the paper, but I can tell you it's not aliens because you know what? Nature is capable of some really shifty business, including making stars disappear. Stars get brighter, stars get dimmer, stars are visible, stars explode, stops, stars stop exploding. Give nature some credit, okay? She's pretty clever. And if she can make a dark star ex disappear, she will. And it's just a matter of chance before we see one happening. Uh, Gassan Akad on YouTube is asking, how can light push an object if it has no mass and thus no momentum? Because momentum is defined as velocity times mass. Uh, but when that equals zero, so how can light actually push things? You are absolutely right. Light has no mass. Like the photon, like the graviton, is massless. It has infinite range, travels at the speed of light, which is pretty handy for if you're light, so you travel at the speed that you were born to. But the equation you quoted, that momentum equals velocity times mass, that only applies to things with mass. Light is its own thing. Light gets its own special set of rules. Light is waves of electricity and magnetism. These are forces. They, they can make other things move. Light has its own equation for momentum, which is related to its frequency. Light has no mass, but it does have momentum. And because it has momentum, it can push things around. I can shine a light on a piece of paper, and if I'm patient enough, and I'm in a vacuum, there's nothing, no other forces, that piece of paper will start to move, even though the light has no mass. Astro B on YouTube is asking, will we put people on the moon in the next decade? In the 2020s, is it time for the moon to electric boogaloo? I, I don't know. This is a tough one, and this is a tough one that just really breaks my heart because I wish I knew. I wish I could say, yeah, the 2020s are when we're are when we're going to have sustained human presence on the moon. And then we can look at the 2030s or 40s of when we're going to start putting some boot prints on some Martian red dust. But I can't say that. I can't say that with any confidence. And related to that, Astro B is following up with, will we put a human in orbit around Mars? Will we at least get a mission out to Mars that loops around and comes back like they did with the Apollo missions before the actual landing? That seems unlikely. I'm going to give that as strong unlikely for the 2020s because that kind of a long-duration human mission is something we've never even come close to trying before. And oh, when it comes to the moon... Oh, the best I can get out is, I hope so. We're almost out of time today on Space Radio, but before we go, it's time for the Blue Shift. Oh, the show's almost over. The show is almost over. How sad is this? I know we've got some good questions. 2020 and still no aliens. That's exactly right. James Webb did not launch in the 2010s. Ah, my timer fix. I'm Paul Sutter and you're listening to Space Radio. And this is the Blue Shift, my opportunity to get a little bit closer to you. And what I want to talk about is looking ahead to the 2020s. Uh, what can we expect in terms of human spaceflight? 
what we're going to see in a huge advances, I think, in reusable rocketry. We've already figured it out. Now it's a matter of doing it a lot more than we did, which will make access to space a lot cheaper. And who knows what that will bring. The first stab at this is things like the Starlink program to bring worldwide global internet connectivity. But what else, what we might do with increased and cheap access to space? Are we going to put people on the moon or Mars? <sighs> I don't know. I know NASA says we are going to put people on the moon next decade, but they also promised us James Webb Space Telescope in the 2010s, and we're still waiting on that. So you know what? Just, just pinch of salt. That's all I'm saying. Pinch of salt. When it comes to astronomy, I think we're going to be digging really deep into exoplanets. I feel like the 2020s are going to be a decade when we will find an Earth-like planet around the sun-like star, or at least a few of them and some candidates where we can get some measurements of their atmosphere to see if there's any signs of life. I think that's going to go down this decade. And in terms of cosmology, I think we're going to push on finding the first stars and the first galaxies. I think we're going to get some observations and measurements there. This is an, uh, so far a very obscure part of our universe's history of when the first stars and galaxies turned on. And I think we're going to shed some light on it in the 2020s. And as for the space radio, well, I hope it's another year of exploring the universe together. Bosons are very cute, Nebula. And unfortunately, this last broadcast of the 2010s is almost done. Thank you for joining me on this voyage of space radio. Once again, I'm Paul Sutter, and this show is brought to you by you. Go to patreon.com slash pmsutter to learn how you can contribute. Thanks to Greg Mobius for producing, Nancy Graziano for wrangling the space cadets and all, the fine crew at WCBE Radio for making this show possible. Catch the live stream every Thursday at 8 p.m. Eastern. Visit spaceradioshow.com for more info. You can also follow me directly on Twitter and Facebook and Instagram. My name is at Paul Matt Sutter. And of course, thanks again, space cadets, for listening. See you next week. And remember, all next decade, science is for sharing. End of transmission. Wow. We did it. We did it. The decade is over. Space radio is winding down. How else should we celebrate but with some beautiful, beautiful cheese? Now, what I have here today, this is from uh, Roth Farms in Wisconsin. Good old Wisconsin. King of cheese. That's a title. What do I have here? I have a green goddess Gouda. A green goddess Gouda. So you know Goudas are really Gouda for mixing a bunch of junk in, which is exactly what they did. Like, hey, if you've got some random leftover vegetables, toss them in a Gouda. The Gouda can handle it. And there's a good chance uh, it'll be a safe bet. Green goddess, I'm confused by the concept of a green goddess. I know there's this green goddess dressing, which apparently involves a lot of, and hence this is what's in the cheese, uh, parsley, garlic, tarragon, and chives. Isn't that just ranch dressing? Is green goddess just ranch dressing for hippies? I don't know. Is this really just ranch dressing cheese? I don't know. It only costs $3.00. Usually I try to buy a little bit more expensive cheese because, you know, I only get to do this once a week. I might as well make it worth it. But this is on sale. It was too hard to pass up. $3 cheese, though, you never know. But it's still good. Actually, it literally it says good through. No joke, no joke. You guys ready? Good through December 19th of 2019. This is the last day. This is it. Green goddess. Mwah. I'm glad we found you. And now look, for Space Radio, I, I was in the store a couple weeks ago and I just couldn't resist. I bought a cheese knife set. But look at these guys. Look at all my new little friends. 
Look how happy they are to slice and to serve cheese. I may be talking to them, you know, all evening as I sit and eat my dinner alone. I'm fine. But we're going to take this little guy. Hey! And we're going to check out this green goddess, green goddess Gouda cheese. Because I want keep wanting to say green goddess dressing because that is the only... Oh boy, this is soft. That is the only place where I've seen green goddess is in dressing. It's not like I see green goddess burgers or green goddess bell peppers, green goddess tofu. So I keep saying green goddess dressing, even though this isn't. It smells pretty good. I mean, I know I'm going to like it because it's creamy dairy goodness. And there's parsley, which is yay, garlic, which is yay, tarragon, which is yay, and chives, which is yay. So, uh, and also this is uh, RBST free. So that's yay. Uh, so there's nothing like wrong in here. And it is the last day I can eat it. Ooh. Very, very, it's been out. I've been letting this sit out because of course, folks, don't eat your cheese right out of the fridge. You're doing yourself a disservice. Why are you wasting all the calories on cold cheese? Bring it to room temperature. I don't care what the package says. Bring it to room temperature. That way you get all the dairy goodness. And you can see inside there, typical, you know, Gouda mixture with lots of herbs in it. So here we go. Hmm. 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 Pause. I'm, I'm doing another bite. I'm doing another bite because I was caught off guard. Mm-hmm. 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 Okay. Gouda is always an easy win because it's just so creamy and melty and... Slight, slight nutty, but not quite as nutty as Parmesan. So Gouda is always good. The I wonder if the tarragon isn't doing it for me. Parsley is always going to be happy. Garlic inside of cheese is no-brainer. Chives are just chives. 